Hi, I'm Batsheva Frankel from Overthrowing Education, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Coming up on episode 177 of the House of EdTech podcast, I talk with Nate Nagel, old friend of the show. And today we're going to continue a bit of a 2020 reflection as we talk about what would you do differently if this ever happened again? Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It's me, your old pal, Chris Nessie, talking about education and technology. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. If you're brand new, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you're making this podcast a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. Got a great episode in store for you. Like I said, at the very top, I got a conversation with Nate Nagel that I'm going to share with you in just a couple of minutes. First, bit of a, an update, uh, a call to action, if you will. I'm going to ask you now, please stay tuned to the very end of the episode because I need your help with the next episode, episode 178. This episode is going to be released just before my 40th birthday, and I would love it if you'd consider being a part of the episode. So please stay tuned to the very end. Next, a little bit of a ed tech current events, and this really, really aggravated me. And I'm sure if you're not aware, it's going to aggravate you. And if you're already aware, you are going to be fuming right along with me. And that is some recent announcements from Google that they are making some changes to Workspace, Google Drive, whatever they're calling it. They are changing how storage works. So I'm going to cite and quote from two articles here. First, from Digital Information World, which is digitalinformationworld.com. The headline, Google has announced that its unlimited drive storage feature will now be limited, and this will go into effect soon. So, from the article, Google has always had something up its sleeve, whether it is for its Google Chrome or Google Docs. The multinational company is always up to something with trying to launch features that can make the overall experience of their users better on whichever platform they land their hands and eyes on. But sometimes these features can be short-lived as well. Google in the year 2020 announced that the storage limit it had for its Google Drive would now be limited, and it's going to now impact Docs, Sheets, and Slides. They already previously announced that uh, photos and photo storage through Google Photos, that that would be affected. Now, they initially came out and said that this was all going to go into effect of June of 2021. And they pretty quickly said, "Uh, okay, no, hold on. We're going to give you till February of 2022. So let me move over to the Google blog. And this is workspaceupdates.googleblog.com. So here we go. Uh, Quoting, what's changing? We're extending the previously announced timeframe for upcoming changes to the Google Workspace storage policy. The updated timeline is as follows. June 1st of 2021, high quality photos will count towards your drive quota beginning June 1st, 2021. There is no changes to this timeline. February 1st, 2022, any newly created Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, Drawings, Forms, or Jamboard files will count toward storage. 
Existing files within these products will not count toward storage unless they're modified on or after February 1st, 2022. So this is not good, right? So as I interpret it, and if I am interpreting this incorrectly, please uh, reach out to me at Mr. Nessie on Twitter, or you could email me feedback at chrisnessie.com. But as I read this to myself and to you, I understand this to mean that as of February 1st, 2022, any new Google files, docs, sheets, slides, forms, drawings, Jamboard, any new files you create will count towards your storage. And as I read, uh, I'm not quoting it, but this is not just personal. This will also impact Google for education. So this affects us as educators. You will no longer have unlimited storage on your Google Drive through even your school Google account. I know, right? This is crazy. But what they're saying here is, is that any existing files, they're not going to automatically count towards your storage unless you modify them. So basically, everything in your Google Drive right now is not going to count towards your storage quota until you open it up to modify it, make a copy, edit it in any way, shape, or form. This is not good. I don't have any solutions for this. Obviously, schools and districts are going to have to probably pay for storage or they're going to start to encourage you to clean out your Google Drive and delete things and better manage your file storage. But this is not good. Some other things that I'll pull out here. So this is, again, from the Google blog. Uh, They're saying why it's important. And they say, quote, people are uploading more content than ever before. In fact, more than 4.3 million gigabytes are added across Gmail, Drive, and Photos every day. These changes to our storage policy are necessary to provide our users with a great experience to keep pace with the growing demand. How is taking away storage providing me with a great experience? I'll be honest. You are Google. Provide more storage. All right? But ultimately, this really can't come as a surprise to people because it was free, you know, and unless you're doing like, you know, Google for education or Google workspace for education, you know, that, that you're paying for that almost enterprise level support and the unlimited storage. And, you know, for many years, it's been, you know, the 15 gigabytes for personal accounts and, you know, in effect, Google is right. There is more content than ever before being created. The problem is, and we all got suckered into this. We got, we, we bought into free. And, you know, Google is well within their right to decide what they want to do with it because we are the product. We get the ads in Gmail. Again, is it a good thing? No. Will there be opportunities for other players in the space to step up and provide alternatives? Absolutely. All right. Change and innovation are inevitable. It just really stinks that, you know, we've had... A pretty tough go of it the last year plus, you know, as I record this in uh, April of 2021, it's not been easy recently. And we are probably as teachers creating more digital content than ever before. Part of me wonders, and it begs the question, would Google be doing this had the last, you know, 18 to 20 months not happened the way it did with the pandemic and people creating way more digital content than ever before, where, you know, whether it's more emails or more files on their Google drives, et cetera, would this still be the case? Now I know they announced the whole thing with Google photos, you know, last year, and, you know, we're getting close to that June deadline where photos will count towards your storage quota, but I don't know. Again, I, I don't have the answers. I'm just reporting on what I've learned. And if you were not aware, now you are, and uh, we will certainly see over the coming months what types of solutions are available, whether the options come from Google or other web technology places, as uh, as the case may be. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And if you want to comment and talk about this, uh, again, at Mr. Nessie on Twitter or email me your thoughts, feedback at chrisnessie.com. And now let's do the EdTech thought and recommendation.
So for this episode, I am combining, I was going to say comboing, and then I turned it into combining, the EdTech thought and the recommendation. And this comes from a recent post I read on Edutopia. And the title of this article was 10 Ways to Harness the Power of the Chat Function. The author of this blog post is Maureen Picard Robbins, and I will link to the full article out at chrisnessy.com slash 177. But I pulled out five of these 10 things that really stood out to me. I'm going to share Maureen's words with you, but this resonated with me in terms of how, whether you are teaching virtual or hybrid, or really as we move into the coming school years, how we can continue to leverage chats in class. And I think the back channel in general has really become something of value where whether you're in faculty meetings, department meetings, or in your classes, you know, from doing what we've done this last school year, that a chat, whether it's Zoom or Google meetings, it's invaluable to be able to chat and be able to respond via text and, you know, communicate that way. So here are five things from this 10 list of 10 that. I think are super relevant. And again, if you want to go, go to chrisnessy.com slash 177, and you can click the link I put in to get to the full article, uh, the full 10 items. But here we go. And I'll use the same numbers from the article. So number one, chat me. And again, I'm sharing Maureen's words, but I agree with what she's saying. So Maureen says, my class chat is always open. I pause at key points in the lesson to invite chat such as after a warm-up or direct instruction. I want to know that the students discussed after they come out of breakout rooms what they learned. Inviting students to chat me facilitates student comments, questions, connection-making, and time to process information so that it sticks. I offer, as one of her student teachers called it, a chat-no-chat option where students can choose whether they want to jump in and voice their responses or write it in the chat. Now, here's my thoughts, me, Chris Nessie. Part of this also seems like a little bit of common sense. If you were not encouraging students to use the chat at any point during you know, the pandemic and hybrid and virtual teaching, shame on you. It was a, an opportunity to get your kids chatting. And if wh- whether they're maybe misusing the chat or acting inappropriately in the chat, that's called uh, a teachable moment and some digital citizenship that should have been included. So that's kind of my thoughts on, on that first point. And, and I leverage the chat as well, mostly because my students, they're not keen to unmuting their microphones. I have a couple that do. Uh, and as I record this, I'm just a couple of weeks away from having students return to my classroom uh, where I'll have four cohorts and I will have some students with me each and every day in each class. Um, but I, I actually just told them that when you're in the classroom, if you're coming to school, I've I've been more than respectful of not I've never forced a kid to turn their camera on while they're at home. When you come into the classroom and you come into school, my thought is I can ask you to turn your camera on because you're in school. So I, I said, if makeup is your thing and you got to wear a mask, you only have to do half the work and just make up your eyes. So that that's uh, uh, the warning I gave to my students that when you come in your camera will be on in the classroom and I will hear your voice and people will see you because I think when you come to the classroom, I have every right to ask you to do that. Number three on this list. And again, I'm not giving you all 10 and I'm kind of jumping around, but the number three item on the list, thank students and acknowledge their chats. Again, these are Maureen's words. I want to build a community of respect through chat and directly connect with each student. I also want to be inclusive and incorporate multiple modalities to give kids another entry point. So I will read a chat aloud. A student might struggle with typing and submit a partial response and find him or herself wanting to say more. I agree. I, I, when I do my Google meets, it's like a live stream. It's like watching a live radio show podcast, you know, surprise, go figure that I try to be entertaining when I am doing the live virtual meetings that I do, I monitor the chat and it's like the kids are watching YouTube, except it's through Google meet. So I am reading the chat and I am prompting them and inviting them. And I all the time acknowledge what's coming in on the chat, even the funny stuff, even the weird stuff. 
uh, because I am grateful for anything that my students want to put in the chat. So that's where I'm at on number three. Number four, prepare prompts. Obviously, when we're looking at what Maureen says here, we're looking at putting stuff in the chat to get the kids to write. So here's what she says. My goals include building writing fluency and reducing student impulsivity, you know, where they will add anything to be heard. So my prompts are composed as sentences, and they include a writing length. Here's an example Maureen gives. Describe your emotions in five sentences or more after reading chapter four of The Hate You Give. She'll adjust the length requirements for time and purpose. When the writing request is long, she will suggest that her students compose their thoughts on paper or in a document and copy and paste into the chat. Then in the chat, that is the classroom, she will look for a paragraph of talk. I think this is a great idea, and it's no different than when we give writing requirements on traditional assignments. So why wouldn't we try to apply this to our chats in our virtual and hybrid settings? Number seven, monitor the chat. Maureen says, I toggle between listening and reading the chat. Some teachers are not comfortable with this. Invite a collaborating teacher or any other support adult in the room to track the chat. Train student monitors to observe the chat. Reserve questions for later and maybe create a parking lot for the things we're curious about or topics that emerged that we want to know more about. This makes perfect sense. And again, if you're not familiar with live streaming or talking and monitoring a back channel, well, let me say this. You should have been paying attention a couple years ago when back channeling in classrooms was a thing. Then you would have this skill to be on a video chat and kind of monitor what's going along in the chat room. But what I do like here is if it's not something you're good at, I'm sure you've got a student in your class who you can give a job to. I know that in talking on Podcast PD with the incomparable Stacy Lindis, she talked about creating jobs for the students who are not only in her classroom, but the students who are virtual. Because as she talked about it, in a traditional classroom, she's got jobs for her kids to do. She gives them responsibilities and things that they have to do during the day. Why not apply this to what we're doing in things like a chat where you can have students monitoring the chat? And the last one that I picked out is number 10, and that is download your chat as an artifact. Maureen says, this document memorializes the conversation. Post it in a designated space or share it with students via email. I'll throw in my thoughts here. Download it as a Google Doc. As a, I mean, you get it as a Google Doc in uh, Google Meet. You could post that to your Google Classroom. You can create a category under the assignments area where you post all the chat transcripts. And that might also help with discipline, knowing that students can see that, oh, what I type in the chat does not just go away. So it's kind of that uh, reading between the lines, hidden digital citizenship piece that you can contribute. Maureen goes on to say, this could also serve as a brainstorm page for future writing, research, or inquiry. It also might be useful in discussions with teacher teams and administrators when setting future school-wide goals or adjusting grade-level instructional plans. Simply downloading the chat is going to be valuable, not just because it's a, a record of anything that goes wrong in your chat. But again, if you're going back to those prepared prompts and students are contributing lengthier responses, now you've got a record of it and it just doesn't go away when you're done with that meet or that Zoom call, because now you've chronicled the chat in a document form that can be saved for later. Now, using the chat is not going to be an exact substitute for face-to-face -face conversation. I know this you know this. But when we use the chat with more intention, it can create an electric connection between teachers and their students and students with their classmates. When we use chat, you have the power to create a collaborative learning space with opportunities for formative assessment, summative assessment, checks for understanding, and you'll have the ability to better plan lessons that invite student engagement, which is what we all want. But most of all, chat offers a way for us to connect with or even bond with our students. And last time I checked, 
That's what we ultimately do. We build relationships with our students. And here is one way that when you're virtual or you're hybrid, or if there's no more snow days in your school district in the future, you can think of a way to be more intentional about how you might leverage the chat in a meet or a Zoom call, or even when you're face-to-face, have a back channel going in your classroom. That's the EdTech thought and the recommendation. If you have other ways that you are using chat right now, I would love to hear about it. Go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback or tag me on Twitter at Mr. Nessie and let me know how you are using chat. I will have a link to this article again, 10 ways to harness the power of the chat function by Maureen Picard Robbins. And that's out at edutopia.org. I will link to that at chrisnessy.com slash 177. You could check out the other five things, but these were five that really stood out to me that I wanted to share with you. And again, if you're doing other things with chat, let me know. Let's continue the conversation. Back in a recent episode, and that would be episode 175 to be more specific, we, well, AJ Bianco and I, we had a conversation and we reflected on 2020 around the one year mark. Now, here we are two episodes later, and I want to continue the reflection because I had a great conversation with former guest of the podcast, Nate Nagel. Nate Nagel is a middle school technology teacher, and all-around awesome guy. He's been on the podcast before. I'll include a link to his previous appearance. Appearance? A link to his previous appearance out in the show notes at chrisnessy.com slash 177. But we had a conversation where we talked about what would we do differently if we had to go into lockdown quarantine again. Basically, more reflection on what we learned And Nate shares his story. So without further ado, here is a conversation I had with Nate Nagel about what we would do differently. Another 2020 reflection. All right. I want to welcome back to the podcast, Nate Nagel. Nate, the last time he was on the show as a full featured guest was back in episode 91 where Nate talked about harnessing education technology when you're absent and you're not physically in your school. So it's funny that we're going to almost sort of come full circle as we talk about what we learned from teaching not full-time in our schools, just with everything that's going on. So if you don't remember Nate, Nate is a husband. He's a father. He's an educator. He works at the middle grade level. His passions include education technology and a whole lot more. But welcome back to the House of Ed Tech, Nate Nagel. Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be back. I can't believe it's been since 91. Wow. I know. And, and at, at this point, it feels like maybe that was in 1991. I don't know. It really does. <laughs> I, I thought of such a better title for that episode, too, called Be Your Own Substitute Teacher. Well, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it as is. But after I after we were done recording, I was like, I should have told Chris that because it it's, has a nice ring to it. But that's beyond the point. Let's talk a little bit about uh, where we're at here in late or I guess early 2021. Yeah, let, let's let's dive in. So we're going to have a conversation about what we've learned. So this is kind of an extension of episode 175, which is a few episodes ago where I talked with AJ Bianco about things we learned from the pandemic and teaching remotely and virtually, but you came to me with a bit of a different spin on it, which was, you know, what did we learn and how can we apply this learning? So let's dive in. Nate, what have you learned from the last 12 to 15 months? A a lot. I I really feel like this has been going back to school experience in every respect. Uh, I restarted my first four years of teaching was an online teacher at an online only high school. That's what I did. And then I went into brick and mortar and I've been there ever since. And this is my 11th year of teaching. So been there for a while. Uh, Like it, love it. 
Uh, and this was a, a real wake-up call that, uh, one, technology has changed, two, our world has definitely changed, and three, that we really need to get on the ball in combining technology and how our world works in a much more cohesive way. Because the initial kind of reaction when we went and closed everything down in March was triage. Let's try to just make sure that education can continue. Uh, my district shut down for two weeks while we tried to scramble and figure out what we're going to do. And then from there, essentially, uh, they hired teachers to produce uh, little mini lesson type things to send out to the rest of the county uh, for all the teachers to be able to access. So I was one of the writers of curriculum for uh, the high school level and middle school level classes uh, for tech, tech ed. And uh, we basically provided a new lesson or two each week that was consumed. And that was an experience in itself. Um, I think there's a lot of missed opportunities with learning and uh, engagement there. Uh, and then this year, uh, just to give you our model, uh, we are basically following an A and B day schedule with Wednesdays being a... Uh, a teacher check-in day. Uh, so that's a full office hours type day where kids can come and check in with us at any point during that day. So we follow bell schedule with that A and B day. It's very much like normal school, except instead of our normal 48 minute classes, they're now up to an hour. So that's a lot of time to fill. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff going on there and it's supposed to all be synchronous, but I find it very difficult uh, to connect all those things. So there's a lot of stuff I have floating around in my brain that I'm trying to going to try to put eloquently here. I'm going to do a terrible job, warn you now. Uh, but I'm just trying to kind of go through and kind of I've written down written down notes over time here just to reflect and see where things are at. Uh, and the first thing I have written down on my notes is some good news. Uh, if you remember when the pandemic started, John Krasinski of The Office and many other fames uh, did this show on the uh, YouTube and it was called Some Good News. And it was engaging. It was heartwarming. It was fun. Uh, and then they sold it and broke everybody's hearts. But that's beside the point. And you uh, haven't but, heard from them since. Exactly. That thing <laughs> went away. Uh, I mean, I think it was supposed to be picked up by CBS All Access or Paramount Plus, whatever it's called. But I haven't heard anything about it. And I think part of that's just the outrage of selling something that was so seemingly wholesome. Uh, but what I really looked at that was, one, the production quality. Not amazing. There was no outstanding, amazing production quality. The guy clearly had a team behind it to help him out, um, but they used iPhones for all their production stuff. That's what that was shot on. I'm sure they used better quality mics, but at the end of the day, the production stuff wasn't really all that amazing. Um, they've reached millions, tens of millions of people with low production quality, uh, with being able to just have fun and be wholesome. And I think uh, for me personally, I really missed the chance to connect with my students in not doing something similar, but being in a way to uh, connect with them in a different medium, um, whether it be YouTube, whether it be video, audio, uh, whatever, but a way to reach them in a, in a slightly different way to have them see me in a slightly different way. Um, I know I was personally in triage mode at that point. I had a kid who was not in school yet. Uh, my wife was working from home. Uh, we were just trying to make sure we could manage my son throughout the day, that we could manage work throughout the day and all of that. But looking back, if I had a chance to do it again, I would try to find some outlet to be there for my kids in a different way than what I could previously. Now, w what you said there and bringing up the whole the, the some good news thing and talking about production value and and, and content that's a great example for everybody that content trumps production value. So you can get away with lesser quality, but not on the content side. If you have good content, and again, as a teacher, we have our curriculum and we have things that we want to teach and share and talk about. You don't need to have the fancy stuff. Sure, I got a fancy microphone with the podcasting. Nate has the fancy setup with what he did with online teaching and creating content. You don't need that. You can literally just use your iPhone, just kind of put yourself out there. And it's not that hard. The, the hardest thing is overcoming just hit record. And I've been saying that for years now, just hit record already and uh, jump in. My experience at the beginning of all of this was I jumped into podcaster mode. You know, I was doing private live streams, and now that I say that out loud, that sounds awkward, but I was doing private <laughs> live streams for my students. Uh, you know what? This is not getting any better. I was doing unlisted YouTube live streams because I didn't have Google meet and I wanted to engage my kids at, at the high school. And I, I just thought YouTube, the kids that I had a relationship with 
up until that point in the school year, we talked about creating content and being creative, or, you know, the four C's, which, you know, that that's, that's my jam. So engaging them on YouTube seemed like a natural fit where I could take advantage of the chat. You know, they could see me at home and see this setup. And even this year, I get on the first day in the Google Meet, you know, a more formal platform to, to teach online. And I get on the first days of school and they're like, yo, Mr. Nessie, you're a YouTuber. What's going on there? And I'm like, well, sort of, I'm famous and have a big head in my own head. Certainly jumping in and being creative is, is something that comes naturally for me. It may not come naturally for every teacher because let's face it, Nate, there are some boring teachers out there, right? There are teachers who don't know their ankle from their elbow when it comes to technology, but that's where people like us come in who can support them. And whether you're a formal coach or an informal coach, you know, we, we do the best we can. You said early in your career, and we talked about this the first time you were on, and, and now here again, we're bringing it up, but you spent part of your career teaching at an all virtual school. So prior to 2020, we're going back to, to what years, what, what four year range roughly were you teaching online? So this was roughly 2007 to 2011 ish, somewhere in that range. Okay. So in that time period, I remember that's early in my career where Gmail is in beta, Google Docs is brand new. And, you know, I was the teacher who made up his own permission slips and got kids to sign up for Gmail so I could have kids using Google Docs and Google Drive back in 2008, 2009. What about that four year experience for you? Were you able to think back? I was built for this. I've been I trained for this years ago. Now is my time. What, what did you lean on and what were you able to go back into your bag of tricks and do through this? So a lot of what I learned there was one was coding and making a virtual lesson technically correct as far as making it look nice, uh, vi be visually appealing and being able to include the elements that are necessary, uh, which for me, when you're doing an online lesson, you have three main components that are necessary. You have to have images of whatever you're trying to do and teach. You have to have a video component of whatever you're doing and trying to teach and an audio component uh, because uh, you also have text as well. But I think that kind of is just the the, the standard. Um, everybody, when they go to a website, they expect to see text somewhere on that screen. Those other three things you may or may not ha have access to depending on what you're doing. Uh, and uh, really having those things there, uh, making sure I could technically build the website uh, and also know how to structure it for students to be successful. Uh, because you have to learn that students aren't going to look at things the same way that you design them to be when you're doing things. So you have to have your clear objectives. You have to do all this stuff. But it's the, it's different than what it is in a classroom. Because in a normal classroom setting, if you see some, a kid having trouble or something, you can go over to them and direct them or give them that one-on-one -on -one help. Whereas if they're doing it online, synchronous or asynchronous, you don't necessarily have that ability to do that spot check correction right on on there. Uh, so providing areas for kids to test and show what they know to be successful or to fail and having the resources to kind of correct them when they are doing things incorrectly. Right. That, that's a big thing right there that you just said about, you know, when we're in the classrooms and I see this in social studies, you see this in technology, we can see the confused look on our students' faces. We can see when the light bulb above their head is just kind of like flickering or, you know, kind of, kind of sputtering as they're processing things, but their avatars don't show that, you know, cause we talked before we hit record about not seeing a lot of kids faces and, you know, we're not concerned with the camera, but that takes away the ability to see the confused look on their faces. So teaching technology, I feel is difficult when I'm in the room with 25 to 30 people. You know, my approach is I do that from behind everybody where I can see all their screens. And I've said for years, I don't care how old the learners are getting 30 people to do the same thing at the same time on a laptop. Good luck. But you do that every day. What does it look like for you in the virtual setting that either you tried things didn't work or, you know, what, what kind of methodology have you settled on to actually help kids that you can't see? In all honesty, it's still something I'm figuring out. Uh, it's, it's a world that, uh, I wish I were better at, but I'm still improving learning each day with it. Um, what I've found that works for most of my kids. Now this doesn't work for all of them and I still have issues I need to address with some of my kids. Uh, but the one that works for most of them is I'm a very, even in regular school uh, or traditional setting, I am very much a, 
We're going to do something for five minutes. I don't want to talk. I want you to do. Uh, so what my general process is, is we're going to talk or view or do something for that five, maybe 10 minutes at most to learn the skill, to do the basic parts. And then we're going to go use whatever it is. Uh, so for instance, if we're doing 3D modeling, uh, I teach Tinkercad, I teach Onshape, I teach a whole bunch of different 3D modeling things. Uh, if my goal for you is to make a perfect cube and we start off with something that's a crazy trapezoid and you have to figure out how to get it back into cube shape. We'll start off, we'll go over, look at the problem. Uh, we'll go over techniques that you could use to solve it. And then I'm going to give you 10, 15 minutes to try to figure it out. And during that time, uh, I can see as submissions are rolling in, I can see real time when kids are doing things because I generally use Google Docs for everything. So I can just scroll through and see who's doing what. And as they're updating their sheets to do whatever, I can check in with the ones that aren't updating and I can throw them into a breakout room and do one-on-one -on -one help. Now, is that successful all the time? No, because sometimes they're just not on the other side of the screen doing anything, and that's why it's not getting done. But for the ones that are struggling, I can have that one-on-one -on -one time that I'm used to having in the classroom, where I go in, I sit down next to the kid, and we work together through the problem. Have you found students' ability to advocate for themselves when they're struggling? Have you seen that improve? Because I've seen some improvement where I know I'm getting kids who are over the school year more comfortable saying, I don't know, Mr. Nessie, can you help me, et cetera. What, what are you finding in that area? Uh, absolutely. I'm finding that kids are more willing to ask for help or more willing to speak up when they're confused, especially because we use Zoom, um, but they can private message me, which means that they don't have to have that classroom. I'm going to raise my hand and be embarrassed in front of everybody. They have the ability to be an anonymous as far as the rest of the class is concerned. And I can address them without ever saying their name or say, or I can pretend like, Hey guys, I'm seeing this problem that people are messaging me with. Let's talk about this. So I can address a small problem on a much wider scale. And generally I find that even though there still are kids who won't ask for help, uh, that one kid who does take that uh, effort to go through is asking the same question as, 10 other kids in the class. So they, they always help. And they found that as they ask more questions, we get better products overall. I'm thinking, Nate, I don't know about you, but, you know, prior to all of this, you know, I've, I've done episodes and I've talked about how to use the back channel in the classroom. But I think this is now living proof that when we're in person, I'm going to figure out a way, whether it's through Google Meet or maybe I've got a hangout going during class time when the world is quote unquote normal where kids can send me messages and I can basically still have a chat going and have that back channel throughout regular class. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think that's a phenomenal idea. I would, I'm definitely going to be doing something where there is a way for kids to privately ask for help without having to be embarrassed in front of everybody, uh, especially at the middle school level when that, that, Cha social change, the physical changes, all stuff is hitting them all at once. I feel horrible for them, number one. Uh, but number two, there, there's just so much going on that they can't get out of their own way a lot of times. And uh, providing a, a place for them to pr just ask basic questions without that fear of social stigma or anything else is, is such a positive thing that I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing that back when we resume regular school. Nate, what do you think are some tools and technology that you've been able to leverage during this time that again, as, as an extension of what we were just talking about, that you think will still play a role in your practice? So I, I'm a, I've talked about this before on other episodes where I've contributed. I'm a big fan of Camtasia. It is a screen recording tool that's for Mac and PC. Uh, you can also edit videos in there. So basically every video I've ever made is done in there. Uh, and I plan on continuing that for as long as the tool exists because it's phenomenal and I use it I'm not lying when I say I use it every single day. Um, a couple of the tools that I've used a lot uh, is another one made by the same company. It's called Snagit. Uh, it's an image editing program, but it allows me to add uh, arrows and point out things. Uh, it's made my ability to make instructions way easier and better. Uh, but uh, those are both paid tools, and that's not what I always like to use either. Uh, I love Handbrake for being able to compress video sizes to make things smaller. Uh, I've mentioned Squish in the past, which allows images to be compressed and smaller. Uh, but those are all on the technical end of things. Uh, the tool I think that I'm going to continue using the most uh, is YouTube. Uh, making videos for YouTube, either through my phone and uploading them directly or through other means. Um, but because it has the ability to have that live translate, that closed captioning on there, uh, it is such a powerful tool uh, that it's just, it's unmatched as far as I'm concerned right now. Nice. 
before we let you go, and I, I thank you for your time here on your spring break, my spring break is we're putting together some fabulous things for people to think about. Let's get the DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour and let's go into the future three years. I'm not going to go crazy. What do you think education looks like as a result of this three years from now? My optimistic answer is that uh, we have much more dynamic, engaging lessons because we're leveraging all the tools that we've learned during this past year. Uh, We have online learning management systems that hopefully schools are not going to divest in, hopefully they're going to invest more in. Hopefully school districts are going to invest in production places for teachers to go in to make interesting content. Uh, I'm very big into video content, so I, I'm very biased into there. Uh, and, and I really hope that uh, we, we keep learning new ways to interact with kids, not only in classroom, but beyond our walls of our classroom. Because unfortunately, uh, pre-pandemic, a lot of times our classrooms ended when the kids left our room. And if we can engage them or get them interested or just give them access to things beyond our walls, uh, that's going to be a better thing for everybody. Uh, more realistically, I think we're going to unfortunately go back to a lot of where we were before. I think there's going to be a big deep breath kind of time where we're going to try to see how this looks. Uh, but I don't see districts wanting to invest the time and money into more devices for kids and to providing internet for kids and families who can't afford it. Um, I really hope that's something that we continue to do as a country, a nation, or as a world is value those type of things. Uh, but I think, uh, the economic fallout from some of this is going to prevent some of that from happening for a little bit of time. Um, But in three years, I think we'll be recovered economically. And hopefully we really start kind of seeing where the next step of education has been, because we're we're really good at production line, assembly line education. Um, My room looks the same as it did when I started. Uh, The the classroom itself has never changed from when the school was built. Uh, And most classrooms, you take a look at a picture from the early 1900s or late 1800s to now, there's going to be a board in front of the screen. It's not a chalkboard, but essentially it's going to be the same exact thing. And hopefully this was a, a, a way or a way for the, the window to open that we can say that it doesn't have to look like this. There is ways that we can structure school differently. Uh, do we have to structure things by grade level or do we do it by ability level? Uh, do we have to structure things by classroom periods or, or by times of day? Can we figure out a different way to do this stuff? And I think there's obviously ways to work through it. It's just we have to put in the time and effort and care to really think through the problems and to experiment. And the number one takeaway I hope that we get from all this is that it's okay to experiment and to be wrong. Uh, as long as that we're trying something for the betterment of our kids and our families, uh, if, if we're doing that with our full hearts, I don't see anything wrong with trying and failing something. It's what we encourage our students to do. It's what we as teachers need to do. And it's what, more importantly, us as school districts and people who make decisions need to do as well. Well, Nate, you were on episode 91 back in 2017. Here you are in 2021. So when I bring you back in the year 2024 for episode 250, which I'm just, maybe I'll be at that point, uh, we'll reflect on this. We'll we'll play this back. No, I got to bring you back more often than I do. So, um, yeah, no, (laughs) um, personally speaking, as you look back at this whole time period, obviously you've done the best you can as a teacher, you do the best you can as a husband and a father, like so many of us do aside from all this education stuff, what has made you grow the most, or what did you learn education? Not what, what's your biggest lesson over this time? Ooh, that's a great question. I think yeah, I'm, throwing, uh, I'm throwing heaters uh, here at the end. Yeah, you really are. Uh, the, the, I, I think uh, the, the, the biggest thing I've learned from all this is to really be patient and mindful with uh, how I do things. Uh, I have a five-year-old. I need to be patient with him. He, he's going through something that he's never experienced before and that his brain is not able to fully process. Um just Nate, I'm going to be 40 and I don't fully process it. So age has nothing to do with this. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I'm still trying to figure out all of my thoughts on this and I don't understand how he pieces it together and gets through every day as great as he does. Um, you know what? Almost, just, you know, you have a kindergartner. I've got my kindergartner, my third grader, and the world is so they, they can look at this and they don't have all the other stuff to worry about. Right. You know, you and your wife, me and my wife. We got to figure out, all right, 
How are we managing the finances? How are we going to make sure we can do the things we do? How can we make sure we're healthy? How can we make sure we're safe? And all they got to do is get up, eat, play switch, do schoolwork. It's super simple for the teeny tiny ones. And we got all this other stuff to worry about. (laughs) It's true. But I mean, again, it comes back to the patience thing is uh, we have a lot to be worried about and a lot on our mind. And I think really being able to focus on things at hand. uh, I I generally try to go through uh, each school year with a theme. And my theme this year was just the word one. Focus on one thing and get incredibly good at that one thing. Uh, So my focus this year was to focus on just being really good at Canvas. That's our LMS's choice. I wanted to be the expert in the building on Canvas. I wanted to make sure that I could focus on that beyond everything else. Uh, So when I was in school, when I wasn't actively teaching... I was screwing around in Canvas, doing the best I could to learn how to do things. Uh, And then outside the classroom, I I needed to just make sure I took a break from school and make sure that home family separation uh, really happened because it's home and family and school are all the same place right now. Uh, So being able to kind of design spaces for want to take place and then not go to that space anymore until the next day. Um, That was really helpful to me. And that's something I really hope to continue over past uh, when this ends is that uh, really just make sure I designate time and spaces for different activities and follow through with that uh, designation. Cause I'm one of those people who at nine o'clock at night uh, will be watching TV and we'll just pull up my learning management system and start grading stuff because I'm just watching drivel on YouTube and I can let that play in the background and sort of pay attention to it, but I can also get work done and being able to focus on one thing at a time and dedicate myself to that one thing. Uh, it is really uh, what I found has been very useful for me uh, through this last year. You're going to laugh at my answer, but the the one skill that I picked up and I, I'm definitely going not with education was my ability to cut hair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that works. You know, I, I, I am now my father's barber and, uh, you know. It, that that's fun. I've given him like six haircuts in the last year and he comes to me when he needs it. I'm gotten really good at fading the boy's hair. And uh, for people who have seen me since all of this, I had to give up because I can't cut my own hair as good as I would like. So that's why I have the, uh, the shaved head, not all the way, but uh, you know, so cutting hair is my skill. So when I retire from teaching, I either a want to drive a school bus, B become a barber or C because I live near the Jersey Shore, I want to open up a little hot dog stand and sell uh, sabrettes at the beach. That sounds, <laughs> you can combine all that into one activity. The haircutting hot dog salesman. There you go. <laughs> exactly. You could, you could do it all. Yeah. The, the, the sky's the limit, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Nate, we're, we're having a good time. For those who listen, who are not connected with you. And if you're listening to this and you are not connected with Nate on social media, I don't want to insult you. Thank you for listening, but you're a fool. So connect with Nate on social media. Nate, where can they do that? Uh, you can either go to my website. Uh, that's NathanNegel.com because I'm so vain. Uh, you can go to my Twitter at it's Mr. No Negel. More, hold on. It's no more vain than ChrisNessie.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can go to my Twitter, which is uh, at Mr. Negel, um, or you can go to my YouTube channel, which again is Nathan Negel. And uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not super active on Twitter. I'm more of a content consumer, but I do plan on uh, increasing one of my goals uh, for the remainder of this year is to increase my Twitter usage uh, as far as contributing instead of taking uh, and also my website contributing instead of taking. Putting stuff out into the world and you're good at that. So I want to see you do more of it. That That's a direct order, Nate. I appreciate that, Chris. <laughs> All right. You'll find everything that we talked about in the show notes for this episode out at chrisnessy.com slash 177. And uh, Nate, thank you for being here. Be well, and uh, I will bring you back before 2024. Thanks so much, Chris. I appreciate you. And before we close out episode 177, it's time to meet this episode's House of EdTech VIP. Congratulations to Tim Cavey. Tim is an eighth grade educator and vice principal in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. In 2019, Tim completed a master's of educational leadership through Vancouver Island University, and the 2020-2021 school year was his 20th in education. Tim is in it for the long haul. His master's in educational leadership program reinvigorated his passion for education. 
His favorite education topics include the five C's. Well, now I feel bad because apparently there's one more C than I, I thought there was. So, so Tim and I have to talk about the fifth C. Anyway, Tim is also interested in design thinking, growth mindset, inquiry, PBL, visible learning, and strategic uses of technology and education. Tim's master's thesis focused on the tremendous power of asynchronous professional development, inspired in part by his podcast, Teachers on Fire. On the Teachers on Fire podcast, Tim profiles agents of growth and transformation in K-12 education. He chats with inspiring educators to bring you their highs and lows, their passions and goals, and the voices of influences that are shaping their thinking and inspiring their practice. In the fall of 2020, Tim began live streaming these conversations through his Teachers on Fire YouTube channel as well. He launched the podcast in March of 2018 without knowing much about the technical side of podcasting. Growth has been steady, and the reach of the show continues to build show after show, month after month. As he continues to learn, improve, and connect with other educators, Tim has enjoyed playing a part in the professional learning across not only North America, but the world. You can connect with Tim through his website, teachersonfire.net. Congratulations, Tim. I'm glad to know you, and you are a House of Ed Tech VIP. Thanks for checking out episode 177 of the House of EdTech podcast. Thank you so much to Nate Nagel for coming on for another great conversation. And like I said in that conversation, I will have to have Nate back sooner than the year 2024. <laughs> uh, let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your reflections on 2020 because we are still learning. And in many respects, we are still in what 2020 has turned education into. So go out to chrisnessy.com slash 177. That's episode 177. Leave a comment or go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Send me an email or on any page on the website. There's a little button on the right hand side where you can send audio feedback to me. And I would love to get audio feedback to share on the show. Now, if you enjoyed the House of EdTech, there's a couple of things you can do. And since you're listening now, you must enjoy the podcast. And I thank you for sticking around. Number one, tell somebody else about the podcast. When you share it on social media, use the hashtag House of Ed Tech, because word of mouth is the best way to share podcasts you enjoy. Number two, come over to the Discord community. Go to chrisnessy.com slash Discord and join us there because I gave up on Facebook and I think Discord is cooler. So why not learn something else that Chris Nessie tells you to try? So chrisnessy.com slash discord. Join us over there for some great conversation. Number three, you could also become an awesome supporter. Many thanks to all of my awesome supporters because they are awesome. And they include Anthony Arnault, Dan Gallagher, Carlos Garza, Peggy George, Jeff Herb, Mike Messner, Matt Miller, JP Prezavento, Patty Reefus, Lori Simpson, and Kyle Wilcox. Thank you to all of you for your support. And if you would like to be awesome, go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the podcast is 178, and that's going to come your way on April 25th, 2021. Now, as I said at the beginning, I want you to be a part of this episode because I'm about to celebrate 40 trips around the sun. My 40th birthday is April 27th. And my plan for this episode is to share some important lessons I've learned in life that I apply to education, education technology. I want to give you the chance to get in my head. I want you to share your most valuable lessons that you've learned, however many trips around the sun you've taken. I don't care. What important life lessons do you apply to education? Reach out to me. I want to include them in the show, and I want to make you a part of this celebration of me. Until next time. Thanks for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. Thank you.